Okay, I'm going to start. Well, hello and welcome. Um, I'm Algis Galukas, and I'm here to introduce uh, a series of talks and discussions um, called What Talks. Uh, they're like TED Talks, uh, they're ideas worth spreading, but only about evolution and specifically waterside hypotheses of human evolution. Now, that sounds a bit of mumbo jumbo. Hopefully, it'll all be explained in the next half an hour or so. Now, it's no coincidence that today is the, the first day of these talks is the 7th of November because it is the birthday of the great Elaine Morgan. So I'm going to start with a little toast to Elaine. Happy birthday, Elaine, 101st birthday today. Now, those of you who know Elaine will know uh, she's got a fantastic history. She was the pioneer of uh, playwriting in British television for 35 years. Anyone of, of my age will have seen countless of her dramas on television and docudramas. Um, she was she won very a uh, few BAFTAs. Uh, she was also a pioneer of the second wave of feminism. So uh, a fantastic uh, achievement there. But for me and many like me, her most important uh, sort of contribution to the world was her pioneering uh, sort of championing of this idea called the so-called aquatic ape hypothesis, which is what inspired these talks. So um, I want to sort of give her primacy on this and make sure that she gets the credit she deserves. Um, I, I think this idea might eventually turn out to be the best idea about human evolution since Darwin and Wallace. And although some people might scoff at that, she did follow in those two great uh, scientists' footsteps and become a fellow of the Linnaean Society. Now, my dream has now been for about 25 years uh, to finish what Elaine started, and that is to take this idea called the aquatic ape out of the rubbish bin labeled pseudoscience and place it back on the table of respectability and respect of scientific inquiry where it belongs. That's been my dream for this past um, 25 years. Uh, uh, but tonight I want to start where she finished by showing a clip from a great TED talk that she gave in 2009, where she was talking about how this idea is going. It's quite sad to see her uh, you know, sort of a little bit uh, less enthusiastic uh, than she was 10 years earlier. So I'm going to flip uh, to uh, this, uh, this video and we can enjoy a few minutes of listening to Elaine. And now we've got to look to the future. Ultimately, one of three things is going to happen. Either they will go on for the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Yeah, well, we don't talk about that. Let's talk about something interesting. That would be very sad. The second thing that could happen is that some young genius will arrive and say, I've solved it. It was not the savannah. It was not the water. It was this. No sign of that happening either. So the third thing that might happen is a very beautiful thing. If you look back at the early years of the last century, there was a standoff and a lot of bickering and bad feeling between the believers in Mendel and the believers in Darwin. It ended with a new synthesis, Darwin's ideas and Mendel's ideas blending together. And I think the same thing will happen here. You get a new synthesis, Hardy's ideas and Darwin's ideas will be blended together and we can go forward from there and really get somewhere. That would be a beautiful thing. So that's really uh, lovely to hear. And uh, of course, that's really what I've been trying to do, I suppose, is blend these uh, two ideas together into a, a sort of a new synthesis. But unlike Elaine, um, I wasn't so much thinking of uh, Darwin and Hardy uh, I was thinking more of the savannah theory and the aquatic ape theory, because the savannah theory does have some points in its favour. I'm not completely against it, 
as we'll see. But the aquatic ape theory also has some things that are quite negative. Uh, I, I don't particularly like the term aquatic ape. It always, I think it seems to invoke images that maybe are a little bit too extreme. And this seems to be maybe the problem with, with it. So one of the things I've always tried to rail against is the idea of mermaids and the man from Atlantis. And I think we should really try to avoid those sort of ideas when we talk about this. So let's please forget about mermaids and things like that. Now, I'm very proud that, Les, uh, that Elaine and, and I uh, sort of jointly did a chapter in a book uh, in 2011 where we wrote about all of this and we came up with a, a new label and a kind of a definition. And in a nutshell, basically, we're saying that uh, it's, it's um, the, since the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, humans have been exposed to more selection from wading, swimming and diving than their lineage has. And that alone uh, explains all the bizarre phenotypic traits that we have compared to chimpanzees. So that's really uh, the main idea that I've been trying to sort of focus. And this might even be very slight selection. I think people don't necessarily understand how little selection you'd need to have a very profound phenotypic effect. So there you have it. That's why it's called what. So WH stands for waterside hypotheses and AT maybe for aquatic theory. But basically you can pick your own acronym out of this. I'm, I'm trying to be as inclusive as possible to as many people who might be interested. Now, another way of looking at the, this label is to ask the question, well, what talks? And of course, the answer is we do. We talk. We are able to talk. And the question that should uh, sort of uh, uh, come into your mind immediately after that is, well, why? How did that happen? Why are we so able to talk compared to chimpanzees? Well, Elaine would approach all of these problems, in, and she did in all of her books, in the same way. She always started her books by asking this really important question. Why are we so different from chimpanzees? I mean, we all know this sort of fact now that the difference between humans and chimps is about 90, well, that we've got about 98.5% of our DNA the same as chimpanzees, so about 1.5% different. But a, a more striking fact that few people know is that actually chimpanzees are closer to us than they are to gorillas and far closer to us than they are to orangutans. But of course, anyone looking at the four species would clearly see that we are the odd man out. As Elaine uh, eloquently pointed out in her, in her book, Scars of Evolution, nobody's the least bit surprised about this. It's not like we expect to see bipedal gorillas, naked chimpanzees, and large-brained orangutans. We know that we are the unique species all the time on this. So the question is, what happened? What happened to make, to make these differences occur? And Elaine and people like us, or like me, uh, certainly believe that it was something to do with moving through water. That seems to tick all the boxes. So I just want to quickly go through the sort of arguments that Elaine would go through in her books, just so that anyone watching this, uh, uh, the, 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 this video will be put on the YouTube channel afterwards for anyone to watch at any time. So anyone watching this will be able to see what we're talking about. So the first one is language. Now, clearly, as I'm rattling on to you and you hopefully can understand uh, what I'm saying, uh, it, that's quite a remarkable thing. I mean, uh, it's like an orchestra of muscles that my brain is conducting right now. My mouth and my tongue and my lips and my chest and my breathing is all coordinated to make these sounds that I've been practicing for 60 odd years. And hopefully it's making some sort of sense to you. Uh, but the thing about a, a, a bonobo and a chimpanzee is they're, they're dumb literally, not metaphorically. They might not be able to speak, but they're very intelligent. And we taught them to do really fine uh, communication with symbols. Uh, so this is um, Sue uh, Ram Ramba Savage with uh, Kanzi, the famous bonobo. And she's teaching this amazing amount of uh, symbolic language, which the chimpanzee could repeat. But the chimp... Uh, but, the, but the bonobo couldn't actually be taught to say even a basic sentence. And we think that this is because of a pre-adaptation to swimming, which gives you this fine breath control. So that's one. Another big difference, of course, is bipedalism. And I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit more detail later on. So I'll just skip that one for now. 
There are other things. So we've got big brains, three times bigger brain than a chimpanzee, and at the same time, smaller dentition. So there's clearly something to do with the diet. Now, clearly, cooking food and uh, the, if using fire had a part to play, certainly later in the story, but our brain size started to get bigger long before that. And it seems to be that for us, that eating shellfish or fish on the coast could have had a big impact. So you could teach a three-year-old to take a pebble and uh, smash open a, um, a, 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 a mussel or a, or a shellfish on the beach. Uh, and, and of course, that also would be an early use of stone tools. Uh, body hair is another big difference. There's no doubt that humans have a very strange uh, body hair pattern when compared to uh, chimpanzees. Uh, and we think that this might be something to do with swimming, uh, uh, drag reduction in the water. Now, we definitely have a lot of body hair, probably as many as chimps in terms of follicles per centimetre squared. But of course, they're very vestigial. They're almost non-existent. Some of these body hairs don't uh, even reach the surface. So compared to terminal hairs, they're tiny. And of course, another big difference is we're fat. This was the thing that first alluded Alistair Hardy, the man behind the theory, to start thinking in this. But what you can't really deny is that infants are born with a lot of uh, adip uh, adipose tissue under their skin, probably about five times more than a chimpanzee. This doesn't make sense on the savannah, and it doesn't make sense climbing trees, but it could make sense at a, at a, on a coastal habitat where a, chimpanzee, uh, where a human uh, infant might be saved from drowning if it floated a bit better. So there's another one. And finally, I've, I've only picked five, there's quite a few of these altogether, but I'm just picking what I think are the big five. We've got respiratory system differences. So you can see here, we've got Jane Goodall kissing a chimp with her inferiorly orientated nostrils. So it's kind of like a hood, almost as if to protect the nostrils from something like water. And even more remarkable is the descended larynx. So when you and I were babies on our mother's breast, sucking the milk from her nipple, we could breathe through our nose and swallow the milk simultaneously. And this is something that, you know, every chimpanzee, and in fact, almost every mammal can do without thinking. Uh, it's just that humans, after about three or four months, have this bizarre uh, descent of the larynx. So from a position where it's actually touching the soft palate, it descends to the point where you're actually risking choking to death every time you swallow. So it's clearly quite a costly adaptation. And one has to think, well, what's the benefit of this? The answer people often give is it gives you a, a, a more uh, rich uh, repertoire of sounds that you could make. So you can make deeper sounds and higher pitch sounds. But I always say to my students, you'd only end up talking like an Aussie with a very high pitched nasal sound like it. Uh, and then uh, and, and, uh, that would be the only disadvantage if you didn't have a descended larynx. So I don't think that's a big enough reason. Of course, what, what we would say is having a descended larynx means that the trachea is going to be automatically closed if the nasal passage got full of water. So these are the four main, uh, the five main things that uh, you know we might decide are very weird about humans compared to chimpanzees. And historically, for decades, centuries almost, uh, we've been taught this idea of the savanna theory. It's, it wasn't already always called the savanna theory. Uh, Elaine Morgan coined the phrase, and she was criticized for kind of coming up with a straw man argument uh, because people said that there wasn't really a savanna theory. But there's no doubt I've been in academia for 25 years and all, all the universities I know teach this pretty much, uh, you know, most of the time anyway. Um, so the savanna theory is basically that the trees gave way to open plains and our ancestors were somehow forced out onto the open plains and that explains all of these differences so i won't go through these uh, um, uh, now one of the th reasons one of the good things about posting this on the youtube channel is anyone could obviously pause this video later to see all of the text if they want to read it so of course the idea that we're thinking of or i'm thinking of is this uh, idea called the aquatic ape theory first coined by alistair hardy in the english language at least and championed as i say for 41 years by elaine morgan uh, who, who did all this fantastic work. And these are the sort of alternative explanations for these things that we would say, basically, as I've already covered. So of all of these different topics, the thing I chose was bipedalism. 
So to me, uh, I suppose it's quite, it could be because my father had a mining accident and spent most of his life in a wheelchair. So subconsciously, I might have been thinking, you know, weird uh, things about bipedalism. But it just seemed to make sense to me. And when I read Elaine's book in 97, The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis, she had four chapters on bipedalism in there. And it just made a lot of sense. And it just seemed to me to be the biggest elephant in the room. Now, I have to point out that at this time in 97, her book had this image in it. And that was pretty much the best evidence she could come up with in 1997. Anecdotal stories, third hand, of proboscis monkeys wading in swamps in Borneo. And I can remember seeing this image and reading it and thinking, crikey, there must be something better than that. Surely chimpanzees and gorillas would also be moving bipedally in shallow water. But at the time, there was literally no evidence of it. It was Simon who pointed out, Simon Bearder, who's going to be talking hopefully in a, uh, later on, who showed me some the first photograph I'd ever seen of a chimpanzee moving bipedally uh, 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 in water. And that was in the year 2000. So this is the thing that I really sort of got hold of. And I just thought, this is amazing. How can this not be a, a major theory of human bipedal origins? It's so obvious. So I've spent the last 25 years of my life studying this to the level of PhD. So I went back to academia. I, I did a, a master's degree at UCL, University College London. I wanted to find out what these academics had to say about this. Why wasn't this taught? Why wasn't it even mentioned? I was never taught about it. And I can remember my, my first day at UCL, we had a kind of a, a student's party. And I remember looking at Leslie Aiello, the professor of human evolution, the editor of the Journal of Human Evolution, and looking at her in the eye, uh, as close as I am to this camera, really. And she was um, clearly not sure. She was nervous. She didn't know what the answer was. And I, I got the confidence straight away that there was something in this, that she didn't really have a good answer. She pointed out a paper called uh, by John Langdon, uh, which was uh, its kind of famous paper. And she, but, but I'd already read that and had already destroyed it with a review. And so next she pointed me to an amateur's website, this shocking sort of scandalous website, really, by a, a, a guy called Jim Moore. And it's basically just a character assassination of Elaine Morgan. And the fact that, that, that Leslie Aiello was pointing me to that was a real shock. Anyway, so for my P P PhD, I basically did a, a big review of all the different weight, uh, bipedal models, and I, I did a kind of a marking rubric. So I kind of evaluated all the different models. Uh, what would be a good model? Did it offer good selection? Was it equal for both sexes? How did it work in, in the ec ecology and so on? All of these things. And to cut a long story short, I uh, evaluated them all, and my son, who's a genius, <laughs> Put this website together anyone can go to this website tinyurl.com forward slash bipedal models the case is important and you'll see all of my uh, evaluations and you can see exactly why i gave that mark and you can put in your own marks and you can disagree with me and see if you can come up with a, a a set of criteria that gives the wading hypothesis a very low mark because that's the popularity they have in textbooks so I, I've, I've, I've tried, to, tried to do that. And I think, how on earth could they could ever, anyone ever do that? Anyway, so when I first met Elaine in 1999, I went to see her. And at the time, it all looked really promising. Uh, everything seemed to be going really well. Elaine was full of beans. Everything seemed to be going really well for her. She was really confident that this idea was about to break through back into the mainstream. And so was I. And we had good reason to be. A few years earlier, there'd been a conference uh, which was uh, chaired by Vernon Reynolds, the very famous primatologist. And it was a, a conference where 11 scientists from the mainstream, uh, people like Peter Wheeler, John Patrick and various others, all met in Holland, in Valkenburg, near Maastricht. And they had this two day conference where all of this was debated in a very serious scientific way. And the proceedings were published in this book. Rode et al. And uh, I remember reading the very final paragraphs uh, by Vernon Reynolds, and he basically said this, I won't read it all out to you, but 
he basically said, we don't think there was an aquatic ape, literally, but we do think there was some selection from moving through water. And I thought, at last, here's some common sense. This is, this is all I've been thinking of since I got interested in the idea. So that's basically, it was a real uh, affirmation for me that we were moving in the right lines. Now, there were also some brilliant documentaries around at the time. So I just want to quickly uh, show you one of them. So I'm just going to stop sharing this and just talk to you a little bit for a second. So basically, uh, th there was a fantastic documentary by Moira Mann, uh, the B BBC and the Discovery Channel. And, and what happened there was they, they did this fantastic uh, documentary about Elaine, uh, which was um, done in South Africa. And the host was... Philip Tobias. It's still probably the best documentary on the subject. Some fantastic interviews in there. And um, I just want to play you a little short excerpt from it. And then I'm going to play you a different one uh, as well in a, 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 in a moment's time. So this is a lovely clip uh, from Philip Tobias. I see Elaine Morgan through her series of uh, superbly written books presenting a challenge to the scientists to take an interest in this thing, to look at the evidence dispassionately, not to avert your gaze uh, as though it was something that you hadn't ought to hear about or hadn't ought to see. And those who are honest with themselves are going to dispassionately examine the evidence. We've got to if we're going to be true to our calling as scientists. That's wonderful, isn't it? But of course, the, the scientists have been averting their gaze and they continue to do so. But then just a couple of years later, uh, when actually we were actually on our way to Australia, this was broadcast in the, B, uh, in the UK. And this is uh, some of my, this is, I think, my favourite two minutes of television ever. <laughs> Suddenly, an image from our remote past comes vividly to light. The time when our distant ancestors, in order to keep up with the changing environment, had to wade and keep their heads above water in order to find food. That crucial moment when our far distant ancestors took a step away from being apes and a step towards humanity. Isn't that wonderful? So I, I, I just love that. That's, that's probably almost brought, brings me to tears every time I hear that. And uh, I wrote to David uh, and uh, uh, he, he told me that he took his uh, team of uh, filmmakers to the Congo specifically to make that recording. He wrote the piece beforehand and he took his film crew and had it all in his mind that he wanted to have that point made with the, uh, with the chimpanzees in the background. So absolutely wonderful. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Bit of technical hitch here. So I just want to share my screen again. So back to the slides. So anyway, that was Philip Tobias. And then this was uh, David Attenborough. And so the we get to sort of the sad thing. So this is now 20 years uh, ago. And we've got to say, well, what's happened? It looked like uh, it was about to get into the mainstream and everything was going to get really, uh, it's going to become a, a, a very popular idea. But the sad thing is, as Elaine said in 2009, for 20 years, it's been, we don't talk about that. Uh, in 2009, it, she said it was very sad and it is very sad. And what's happened is, it, bizarrely, this idea from this guy, Dan Lieberman, seems to have become very popular. I don't really know why. Uh, Elaine Morgan railed against the Savannah theory very successfully in 1972 with her book, The Descent of Woman, but somehow the ideas resurfaced again. It's been reimagined as man, the mighty marathon runner. And uh, Dan, Dan Lieberman thinks that our, our evolution was all about endurance running, persistence hunting across the Savannah, chasing down antelopes. Now, this is a really popular idea. I attended a conference in the States a few months ago, and seven out of 11 of the talks were basically on this idea. And Holly Dunsworth, one of the anthropologists, uh, tweeted the other, the other week 
that she's going to pay, uh, pay her students 5% extra marks if they can demonstrate that they are endurance runners or do long distance walking. It's incredible how this idea seems to have taken hold. Uh, and the one that really breaks my heart most is this one. Uh, Will Harcourt Smith wrote a, a sort of a review paper in the Handbook of Paleoanthropology in 2013. Now this guy did his PhD when I was at UCL and he must have uh, sort of attended a couple of my talks. And uh, this is a, two, uh, a 36 page article with 20,000 words and wading isn't even mentioned once in it. I've written to Will about 20 times asking him about this and he's never replied. It's literally averting their gaze like Philip Tobias said. And of course it all goes on in the social media as well. Uh, Alice Roberts, who's great. I mean, she's a wonderful presenter on television. She's a brilliant anatomist, a brilliant uh, technical drawer, but she is basically somehow against the aquatic theory. And she tweeted in reply to me just the other day, this tweet. So she says, the aquatic ape never held any water. Well, it did in 1987 when the Valkenberg conference was there and a dozen scientists turned up to do a serious symposium and others besides. And she claims that it's not supported by the fossil record and that other of the better hypotheses prevail. Well, I dispute that. Uh, this is a, a poster presentation I did at Cambridge University last week. Um, so I didn't get a spot to give a talk, but they let me do a poster presentation. And I just want to quickly, th this summarizes the whole thing. I'll put this up online if anyone wants to get a copy of this later. But just a couple of things about the fossil record, Sahelanthropus chadensis was found in the middle of a lake, Paleo Lake Chad, next to lots of fossils of hippo ancestors. And we all know about Lucy. Lucy in the lake, uh, it, Lucy in the sky with diamonds is how she got her name, but it should be Lucy in the lake with turtles, because the Hadar habitat was a wetland for a million years, and yet that somehow has passed over. It's a myth that the fossil evidence doesn't support waterside hypotheses. The exact opposite is actually true. Uh, Takar, lake Takana is, you know, the, the Homo erectus, Kubifora, Aldubai Gorge, these are all water, waterside habitats, and common, uh, modern humans have lived by the coast for at least 200,000 years. Uh, the evidence of the earliest bipeds as well, uh, it, it has to be uh, sort of tested whether a non-efficient uh, gait would uh, allow you to walk bipedally uh, easily. And, and I did some experiments to test that. And sure enough, in waist deep water, even a very bent hip, bent knee gait with 70 degrees is less costly than doing it on land. So this is exactly what you'd expect uh, water to help with a non-efficient gait. And no one seems to have worried about the uh, strange pelvis of Lucy. It was what we call a platypaloid pelvis. So wide side to side, narrow front to back, completely out of kilter with all the other primates. It's an absolute outlier. And no one seems to have wondered how they moved. They certainly were bipedal, but it seems to me that a sort of twisting side to side gait would explain that structure better than anything. Anyway, I've tried to do what they said Elaine Morgan didn't do, which is to do some science and test some hypotheses around these ideas. And so far, all the evidence fits it very well. But the best evidence of all is this one. And I just want to show you this because it's it really is uh, amazing. I'm just going to stop the share for a second so that you can just see me. So I'm going to show you now a video. And there can't be better evidence than this. Of all the evidence that we could possibly have, this has to be the best uh, possible. So I'm just going to share this again with you. Uh, and I'm going to turn off the sound. Thank you, Leslie, for reminding me to do that. And I'm just going to play this video because I want to talk as we go through it. So can you see this? Uh, hopefully everyone can see this. This is a, 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 an orangutan wading bipedally. Uh, it's locomotion. It's not posture. Uh, Robin Crompton and people at Liverpool have got the idea of the orangutans in the trees moving bipedally as, a, as an origin. There's, they, they couldn't use their forelimbs, even if they wanted to, if the water's too deep. It's the only model that would actually kill them if they tried to move quadrupedal. So unlike carrying models, unlike threat display models, this is actually low for motion. 
Now, on this alone, it should be the default model that we teach students. But in fact, it isn't because for some reason they just don't like it. Uh, I just want to stop there. So the point, um, did, did you see that? Did I? Did I oh, oh dear, oh dear, sorry. I'm going to have to show that again just quickly. I forgot to do the share. Let me just do that again. I'm really sorry. There was bound to be some teething difficulties here, and here we go. So this this is a, 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 a video of an orangutan wading through shallow water, and it really is, it, it's the best evidence you could possibly wish for. I mean, how could anyone ask for better evidence than this of a model of bipedal origins? Okay, sorry, I'm going to stop that. So the, the, the point really is that uh, I wanted to just to remind you, remember in 1997, when I read Elaine Morgan's book, the best evidence at the time was a, a third hand evidence of a proboscis monkey wading in shallow water. And here in the last 20 years, we couldn't have better evidence than that. And yet the idea that wading was a contributory factor in bipedal origins is, is if anything, um, a, a little bit sneered at more than ever. I say a little bit sneered at. There is one other uh, video I just want to show you, which kind of contradicts me a little bit. And that is a, a video that was uh, shown just a few weeks ago, in fact. And this is gives us a little bit of hope. So let me just share that one. I'm going to put the sound back on. Sorry. And so I just want to play this one. And that's what's so wonderful about the wading hypothesis. In the water, you're buoyed up so that the physical stresses are much less. This is a wonderfully ecological argument for how we became bipedal. That's what we come from, a water walking, wading ape. So that's Richard, uh, that's Richard Rangham. And Richard Rangham is one of the few anthropologists who is uh, sort of in favor of this idea. And I've been writing to him. I'm hoping to have a paper produced jointly with him. And it's really the best news we've had in 20 years. So that's pretty much it. I just want to finish by saying, well, OK, wading might be getting a foothold into anthropology, but all of the ideas that Elaine wrote about really should be covered too. And uh, I've got, I'm very proud and pleased to say that this What Talks program, I've got some fantastic speakers coming up over the next few months, and hopefully we'll explore all of these ideas and we'll get some attention for them. And please feel free to share the, the YouTube channel with anyone that you think might be interested, especially students. So thank you very much. I hope I've not gone on too long. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties I had there. Uh, so I want to introduce Simon now. Uh, Simon, could you sort of say a few words? And uh, if you've got anything you want to uh, ask or contribute, uh, that would be great. I'm just going to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Simon Bearder, and I'm a professor of Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at Oxford Brookes University. I started teaching there in 1978. And I've taught every year that I was there, 32 years altogether before I retired, I taught about human evolution. And it always struck me that there was very little mention of the hypothesis of how we became upright and lost our body here in the textbooks. So each year we'd get a new textbook, or nearly every year, and I'd go through them and I'd look for the words aquatic, bipedal, naked, descended larynx, all sorts of key words, and they never appeared. So I, I really just have two questions, Algis, because this will unfold as we go on through the weeks. But my first question is, have you ever come across, or how many textbooks or anthropology general texts have you seen which give a positive review to the aquatic ape hypothesis? 
Well, I have, question. To say, I have to say the answer is zero. Uh, I mean, very few even mention it, like you say. My focus has been wading. I did a survey of textbooks and their, their, what, their treatment of models of bipedalism. And basically, the wading idea was one of the lowest ranking. It wasn't the absolute lowest, but it was like of, of, of say, uh, let's say 10 uh, different ideas. It was probably at number eight, something like that. And I suspect... Well, I know, I know for a fact that some of the other textbooks, I don't know if you can see this one. This is uh, one of the first books I bought, the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Human Evolution. 470 pages written by about 70 different experts on human evolution. And it doesn't even mention naked skin, not even once in here. Uh, that's that's it just bears out exactly what you're saying, Simon. And I was there when Elaine published her first book, The Descent of Women. And it often struck me that it was a perfectly plausible theory that should be examined in more detail and one, one expected that to happen. But as you say, the, what did happen was that whenever you ask an anthropologist, a biological anthropologist about the amphibious or the aquatic ape theory, they say, Oh, that's rubbish. Mm. And I, my rejoinder to that is, well, why do you say it's rubbish? Have you read these books? And they say, no, of course I haven't read the books. They're rubbish. I wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. So I said, well, you haven't read them, but you you say they're rubbish. And of course, that's embarrassing for them. But one of the reasons that we don't talk about it is that people are so aggressively anti the idea from the onset. And personally, I put that down to the fact that if you just completed a degree in biological anthropology and somebody met you in the street and said, oh, you're an anthropologist, what do you think about the amphibious ape hypothesis? And, and you'd say, well, my professors didn't talk about it. It wasn't in the textbooks. It's got to be rubbish. Yeah which is how anybody would respond. Yeah. So what I'll do later on is pick up the threads of how it affects students and student textbooks and how we've stopped generations of students even beginning to talk about it. So my second question, last question before we open it up is what would have happened after the female, the mothers of, the, of our ancestors lost their hair because this is a very important means whereby chimp babies hang on to their mothers for dear life. They can go through the trees at a rate of knots and they'll just hang on quite safely and be protected in that way. So there must have been a phase during our evolutionary history when we converted from having hair to not having hair over a long period of time, but that would have meant that the baby was had to be cradled in some way. And this makes me think, well, where did they sleep? How, what, how was the infant able to sleep and be protected at night if it was naked and the mother was naked? Well, that's the question. Well, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pass on that one because it's not my area of expertise, but I can see that we've got Mark Verhagen and Stephen Cunane here who might be better able to answer that. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, offer a uh, general discussion about, you know, these matters. And if, I don't know if Mark or Stephen, if you can hear us, would, uh, and you heard the question that Simon asked about uh, naked skin. Would you like to try to answer that one? I think you two are better qualified to answer than I am. So, Peter, did you want to have a word? Yeah, well, I'm trying to get some... Uh, uh, you to hear me, but uh, can, can you hear me, me now? Okay. You can. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on, on getting this going. It's a fantastic achievement, and uh, we look forward to uh, all these um, further talks. Uh, in answer to your question, your initial um, query about other books uh, mentioning the aquatic ape, uh, as you know, Alice Sahadi's paper was written in 1960, 
And uh, Desmond Morris wrote in his book, The Naked Ape in 1967, he looked at the aquatic ape theory, uh, or at least the paper by um, uh, Alistair Hardy and said that the, this aquatic phase was an ingenious theory. It answered a lot of the questions, but the one stumbling block was that he said there's no hard evidence, meaning there's no fossil evidence. And anthropologists for the last 150 years have based their theory on fossil evidence. And this is the one thing, um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon. And I took an interest in this about 35 years ago uh, when I read Elaine's first book. And uh, I met up with Elaine and we discussed various ideas. I sort of concentrated on the head and neck aspects. But with regard to fossil evidence, I thought that um, there's one condition of the ear uh, called exostoses that our bones in the external ear canal, which ENT surgeons have um, known about for over a hundred years, but no one's ever been able to explain what they are. And the thing is, the curious thing about them is that they are only ever seen in people who swim and dive on a regular, almost daily basis. And I wrote a paper in 1992 suggesting that if we were able to demonstrate these exostoses in early human skulls, it would provide the vital fossil evidence. And anyway, subsequently, as you all know, um, these exostoses have been found from one to two million years ago in Homo erectus, and a recent paper has shown that 47% of Neanderthal skulls that were examined had these exostoses, confirming this was the vital fossil or hard evidence that Desmond Morris and others have said was lacking. And you've got Alice Roberts, Chris Stringer, who've written lovely textbooks uh, and brilliant programs on evolution. But as you say, they don't actually mention uh, the aquatic ape. But people have just ignored this vital fossil evidence. And this is uh, something that um, I was going to talk about in due course next July. Um, but you know, in, in your talk, you, you mentioned about finding Lucy uh, in a wetland. But the vital thing is, is not what fossils they're associated with. This is actually fossil evidence actually in the skulls of these early Homo erectus skulls. And it's conclusive evidence. There's more and more, uh, more and more papers on these exostoses. And in fact, they're found more recent papers show that they're more common in males than female skulls at that time, suggesting that it was the males who were doing most of the hunting. And if you look at modern uh, sea divers, free sea divers um, that hunt for a living, um, it's the males who usually go uh, for longer and deeper and the exostoses are more common with them. But I think that one should perhaps um, mention these exostoses as vital fossil evidence, uh, but no one seems to follow that up. Uh, people ignore that. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, when, I, when I was answering Simon's question, I was kind of thinking mainly of uh, the, the sort of the the university level sort of anthropology text of course you know you have a book waterside ape and there are various other books that will that will talk about this sort of evidence but not in the sort of sort of official uh, sort of mainstream type text 
I, I, I would really like to hear from Mark or Stephen if, if you're with us. Are you, can you hear us? Mark, there you can are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, Mark. Hello. Uh, what did you want to? <laughs> I, I want. I wanted you to try to answer Simon's question about body hair and when it was likely to have happened, because you're a, a doctor, you know about soft tissues. <laughs> what's, your, what's your What's your hypothesis on that? When? Well, when... It's, it's not so simple. I think yeah, some. Uh... Some apes, uh, chimpanzees, for instance, also have, have uh, baldness and so. There's the, in evolution, there's also uh, always a, a lot of reversion. There's the, there might have been periods that they were more aquatic and uh, less aquatic. I think uh, the early hominids, uh, humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, lived in the Red Sea, where they uh, partly adapted to, to being. Uh, an aquatic lifestyle, wading and possibly also already swimming, and and and, they, and then later uh, Australopithecines, which are not human ancestors in my opinion, but which are uh, relatives of, of the East African Australopithecines of gorillas and the South African Australopithecines of uh, chimpanzees, they went inland into Africa, while Homo. Pliocene Homo uh, ventured along the southern uh, uh, coast of, the, of Asia, along the, the Indian Ocean. The first fossils of, of Homo erectus come from Java. Uh, so that is there, I think, uh, that they became uh, fully uh, fully aquatic is perhaps a big word, but I think became nearly fully aquatic diving and so on. Wading was probably in when they came out of the water. Uh, she said, uh, Neanderthals had ear exostosis, so there is not the slightest doubt that they were frequently in the water, probably diving with shellfish and so. Uh, late, it's only late place to see, in my opinion, that we came back from uh, being divers, shallow water divers, to be to wading and uh, possibly along the rivers inland, and wading and walking and, and now now we're running, yeah. but uh, we still have very very many features that show that we were strongly aquatic at, uh, at one time. And I think not so long ago, as shown by the ear exostosis of, of Neanderthals and Erectus. About nakedness, we are still out naked, so the, this uh, probably shows that we, it was not so long ago that we were still uh, semi-aquatic. Not only wading, but wading was on the way back, I think, was probably the first uh, stages of becoming more aquatic, and then was uh, one or more more aquatic phases, and then late place to see we became less ac aquatic again. But uh, the hair distribution, the baldness, and uh, the beard, and so it, it was also part of an uh, aquatic adaptations, in my opinion, together with the sebaceous glands. Uh, the, the, exact localization, the anatomical localization of the sebaceous glands and of the nakedness uh, suggests that the, the hair was very greasy and uh, streamlining the body, as I have shown in a few illustrations. <laughs> but I will possibly uh, let's see them uh, within a few months uh, when uh, when I've uh, talking in February, I believe. Thank so you. no doubt, our nakedness is clearly an aquatic adaptation, eh? just like our uh, thick subcutaneous fat layer. And eh? there's not the slightest doubt. It's incredible that they, that they still are running off the antelopes over the African savannas. That is an idiotic theory that uh, I can't understand. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Here we are. In, in, amazing, in, incredible. Uh, uh, they are incredibly on. stupid that they remain stupid. That's what I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I just, there, anybody I just, else who might just speak? I, I, I don't. I want to make it open, and so more. Yeah, I don't know if Gareth wants to say a word, or Andrea, or anyone would like to say something. I think Peter had another comment. Hi. Oh, hello, Gareth. Um, do you want to say something? Hi, Hi Gareth. Gareth. How's it in? Hi, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to comment that um, my face has disappeared. Okay, I just wanted to comment that there's been a lot of mention of how recalcitrant the establishment is in accepting new ideas. And I have a healthy disrespect for academia in general. And the more highly qualified, the less respect I tend to uh, give them because the people get so set in their ways, stuck in a rut. Nobody likes to admit they were wrong about everything. So people stick with what they know. Having said that, um, well, well, and the, the point being that when I've presented the idea for the first time to laymen, when people have seen Elaine's talk on TED, and that's their first exposure, you saw the reaction of the audience in the TED talk. That's the only TED talk ever to receive a standing ovation. That's how people respond. People are reading The Descent of Woman for the first time and that's how they respond. People I talk to are immediately on board and highly enthusiastic. Academics are not allowed to do that. Students are not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to question their professors or their lecturers. Uh, you're gonna lose marks, you're gonna fail your exam. You have to regurgitate what you were told in the first place. Um, but I have to say that sometimes we can be just as bad. We have pet theories and we don't want to let them go. Um, and some of the early suppositions or uh, suggestions that Elaine came up with based on what was known then turned out to be very solid, like the wading um, proboscis monkey. And now we've got David Attenborough wading with chimpanzees and some fabulous clips there. Um, uh, but some of them were just wrong. You can't expect to start up a whole new branch of science and expect every guest to be right first time and always right. I have... Um, Personally, and I, I don't care if I'm allowed to have them or not, but I have reservations about the purpose of the descended larynx. Not about how it came about, but, but um, that it has any anything at all to do with aquatics. Because chimps have an epiglottis, and water goes up their nose, their epiglottis closes. We've all got epiglottises. And so the position of the larynx is I, I'm putting down to something else, which I have uh, gathered quite a lot of evidence for. We say, oh, the nose. Well, other apes don't have noses, therefore it must be aquatic. But a lot, there's uh, no water going down it or something like this. This is not enough. I, I, I don't understand and maybe somebody can explain to me, when you read about evolution, you frequently come across a statement, something like this, that <clears throat> one individual will purely spontaneously, as a form of mutation in his DNA, evolve a new feature. And, and this is where it loses me, I can accept that. This is where it loses me. And then, if it's a beneficial feature, it will quickly spread throughout the species. How? I can understand that behavior, new bits of behavior can uh, spread right through a species very quickly, or an idea, or anything like that. But a physical adaptation, if some guy was the first guy to get multi-pyramidal kidneys to be able to drink salt water, his children are going to have a 50-50 chance of having it. His grandchildren, only one in four will have it. And so on down. So, so I don't see how a new, newly evolved feature 
can spread throughout the species. What I do understand is if you don't have this feature, everybody without this feature will die under the new environmental conditions that prevail. That I can understand. And so that the only ones who survive are the ones who had those kind of kidneys, that kind of skin, that amount of fat, that size of brain, uh, had this kind of diet and so on and so forth. Um, so all the humans who didn't have noses or who had noses like chimps are extinct. What was it about having a nose that kept our ancestors from death? From certain death, because everybody without the nose is dead. And I have a theory, and it's a new theory. And when I put new theories out there, um, it's more interesting than trying to ram our old ideas down people's throats who are resistant. And in this context, um, Peter was talking about exostosis and how many papers there are now written on this. I got interested in shell middens and the fossils in there, what it tells us about the diet, the culture, the art, the crafts. <coughs> you learn so much about shell middens, none of them had been excavated. One or two were excavated and the results were so exciting, but that is now a huge um, thing that's going on in science. If I, if, on my news feed on the scientific sites, they're forever sending me new stuff all the time. Um, about these extraordinary things they're finding out in shell middens. And you've got um, shell middens go or assemblages of shells, small shell middens going back to Java 400,000 BC. And evidence of stone tool used to, to crack them open and, and shape stones for that, at that. So I think it's never going to be that science is going to come on board with Elaine Morgan's aquatic ape theory. What will happen and what is happening is that there's more and more and more stuff coming to light. There are hundreds of millions of tons of fossil evidence in shell middens. There are no big heaps of bones from hunters running across the savanna and um, uh, chasing gazelles and piling up the bones. There are, there are very few animal bones, but there are hundreds of millions of tons of, of clam shells and seabirds and fish and turtles and all the other stuff they were eating in the thing. So I think the um, pretty soon you won't be able to study uh, human evolution without looking at all that, that aquatic stuff. The, the, the uh, omega-3 stuff is, is inarguable, the exostoses are inarguable, and this is all new stuff they're looking at. And they were, people are coming to the same conclusion from their own observations and saying, gosh, we clearly spent an awful lot of time in the sea. That's all I've got to say. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much, Thanks. Gareth. Now, does anyone, <coughs> I'm, I'm a bit nervous about the time because I did say yes. it would be an hour. So I don't want to keep anyone who doesn't want to stay longer. Uh, does anyone else like to say just a few words before we close? I don't want to to um, interrupt anyone else, but just a little point about the hairlessness. As a head and neck surgeon, I do a lot of surgery in uh, the head and neck region. And the one thing that uh, is remarkable is that the only bit of the body that has the subcutaneous fat uh, is below the eyes and the nose. If you look at the scalp and if, you, if you're dissecting or doing surgery on the scalp, it is like a pelt, like any other terrestrial mammal. It is quite different to the rest of the body because it's not immersed in the water whereas the rest of the body is immersed in the water. And that's why we have developed these uh, the subcutaneous fat, the um, streamlining, the buoyancy, but the head remains the same because it is not immersed in the water 
as frequently. Obviously, with diving, it, it is, but uh, not all the time. That's fascinating. That's it has to do more with streamlining, I think, than with, uh, with something else. Yeah. But that's the actual structure. I mean, what I've done is, for the first time, is look at the fact that we are just an animal, like any other animal. We're nothing special. And our physiology, our anatomy, our metabolism is the same as any other mammal. And... I've just worked from basics upwards uh, and have tried in the book to explain hairlessness, uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, the, the descent of the larynx, which I feel is an acceptation, uh, which evolved because of breath holding. And if you read the chapter on the, the evolution of the um, human larynx, uh, the only reason that something elongates, like the, the, the back of the tongue, doubles in length in a vertical direction, um, for what reason? The only possible reason from an anatomical and physiological point of view is that that part of the tongue was pulled down um, by traction and that doubled the length of the base of the tongue and that is because of the negative pressure in the chest with a negative pressure in the in the trachea the larynx the hyoid they are all connected and the base of the tongue is muscle and therefore that can stretch and it was the negative pressure in the chest if you look at divers, and Erica has looked at, at these, uh, the negative pressure in the lungs on diving to 20 meters, the lungs reduce in size by about a third, and a tremendous negative pressure pulling down the trachea, and that is what elongated the base of the tongue. And so, that was why the, the I think the, the base of the tongue doubled in length in a vertical direction. Uh, and it was only in the last um, 70, 100,000 years during uh, the intellectual phase that speech developed because of this exaptation and the difference in the position of the larynx. That was just my view. Well, thank you, Peter. I, I, I think we should uh, finish here. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, if, if, um, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, we've, I've recorded the whole thing. I'm going to put it up onto the YouTube channel in the next day, to, probably tomorrow. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you for everyone for coming and thanks for your questions. If you didn't have a chance to ask a question, uh, feel free to write to us and we will, I'll, I'll try and post uh, written answers and uh, questions on the on the website. And uh, we're, we've got the next talk due on the 12th of December, uh, which is Simon uh, is giving a talk um, about his students' response uh, about Elaine, Elaine Morgan's work, which will be fascinating to hear. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Nyla. Nyla. How are you doing? Thank you. Well Good. done. Thank well you. Done, all this. Thank you, Peter. All the best. All the best. Nice one, man. Well done, Gareth. Thank you. Cheers, Alex. My cup of tea, I think. Oh. Uh, <laughs> is, it, is it nice and warm in Greece, Gareth? We're in bloody Newmarket. It's freezing. Oh, Newmarket. Yeah. We're traveling for the next couple of months, so I'm, I'm kind of out of touch, but uh, oh, okay. keep in touch on my phone best I can. All right. Well, good on you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Right. And congratulations thank on you, the thank you. Yeah. Hello, Isla. How are you? Good. It was a very interesting presentation. I just enjoy what you uh, discuss and present for us. Thank you. 
Okay. And um, yes, it's, I think we, everyone can add a little bit more details uh, to support uh, this theory. Like from physiology point of view, I know there's uh, diving reflex. Um, uh, physiologists can't explain this reflex when people put their face in the cold water, heart rate reduce. So they still don't know uh, why this reflex we have. We still have this reflex. It's probably uh, also a phys uh, from a physiological point of view, functional point of view, it's supported the theory, aqua theory of human yeah, as well. well. I, I was talking to Vernon Reynolds, you know, the guy I talked to about, and he is really interested in that. He, he's a big, uh, he, he, he's, he's, he keeps doing it. He's, he's 85 and he scares his wife because he keeps putting his face in cold water and measuring his his uh, heart rate to see if it still works. And so um, yes, it, it's, it's it something is. that he's very keen on. Yeah. Yes, and uh, about and also about uh, the larynx. Uh, it's interesting uh, uh, hypothesis because uh, I was thinking about what is the difference between us and chimps. And why we start talking, a chimps can't talk. Uh, probably we had first this uh, um, anatomical device first, and then we, for communication, the size of the brain was second after this anatomical device. Might be, I don't know. Just yeah, like no, I, I think so. It's called. Um, a, yeah, 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 because if yeah, if we have to communicate. Uh, in the water, and you have this anatomical device to talk, then brain need to develop more neurons to remember uh, the communication tools, birds. Uh, yeah, so it's maybe completely different explanation <laughs> how we develop this large brain, why we have this large brain compared to other primates. Well, there's, a, What's there's the a group of people, hopefully later in the uh, next year, Stephen Cunane, who's a, 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 a neural scientist, and he's he's got some very good ideas about that, uh, talking about the coastal food chain, a bit like Mark was saying about uh, uh, eating shellfish and, uh, you know. Oh, yes. All of that. It's, uh, really I know that high, more... high, uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids and iodine and all that. Yes, and everyone knows that more healthy food is <laughs> seafood, <laughs> no, not meat. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. I, well, I, I really enjoy it. Thank you for inviting us no, and well, organizing I'm, this series. So, yeah, Thank I mean, you. please invite anyone, any of your students or anyone. That oh, yes, sure. That yes. Would be great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I will that. share. Yeah. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, all the best. Bye. Bye. Hi, thanks for your contribution. Thanks for helping. And do, do you see me with a... I don't see myself on the no, screen. I, I don't think your 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 uh, camera's on. Have you, oh. Maybe your camera's on. I don't on. know how to do it. I don't know anything of this. In in oh. the uh, in the screen... You couldn't you, see me. No, I couldn't see you. We can oh, see your name. Oh. So down in the oh, bottom... Oh, that's you, all. In the bottom, oh, there should be a. Well, video. I don't know anything of these things. Story, see, start video. Do, do you... There it is. Yes, now we can see you. Oh, sorry. I'm very, oh, very right, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, how's, how's, excellent. how's things in Belgium? All, all good? Yes, but with the uh, corona, uh, the COVID, you will say, wow, it's, uh, it's an up, but most people are vaccinated. So, there's no, not much a problem. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm very sorry that you couldn't see me. <laughs> okay. eh? Well, we heard you, oh, we heard sorry. you loud and clear. So that's the main thing. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Till next month. Till eh? next month, if not before. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. All right, well, I'm going to end the meeting now officially. So thank you very much for everyone. And uh, I'll put the video on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. See you, Gareth. See you, Humphrey. Happy Good birthday, month. Elaine. Yes. Here's another, another blast to Elaine. Hooray to Elaine. Happy birthday. <laughs>